Hello, uh, welcome to this class on uh, carbon. Um, so, in this class uh, we are going to look at the material uh, carbon which interestingly uh, is just one element in the periodic table. But if you actually look at literature, you look at uh, uh, articles that are there in uh, you know journals and uh, other magazines, you will find that there is significant amount of work that has been done uh, on this material. So, although it is just one element in the periodic table, there are entire books written uh, on this uh, element carbon. Uh, there is even a separate journal which is uh, titled carbon and that deals exclusively with uh, research uh, on this uh, element. So, therefore, it is uh, considered very, uh, I mean the reason you see that kind of uh, emphasis is because a lot of people recognize uh, its importance uh, scientifically and technologically uh, in a wide range of uh, areas that uh, we would use uh, uh, in the human, uh, you know, range of uh, technologies that we uh, end up using in our day to day life. So, therefore, uh, there is a lot of emphasis on this element uh, and that is why we will spend a few classes uh, looking at uh, the element carbon. Uh, and in particular we will focus on the nano forms of carbon. So, uh, that is the uh, general uh, framework with which we will uh, look at this element. So, our uh, learning objectives uh, for uh, this class are to distinguish uh, between different types of uh, traditionally known carbon structures. So, this is something that you would have uh, known uh, from uh, high school days, uh, possibly also sometime in uh, uh, which depending on the course that you took. Uh, somewhere in your college uh, courses also you might have seen uh, some uh, elements of uh, uh, information associated with this first point that we will look at which is distinguishing between different types of uh, traditionally known carbon structures. Uh, we will take that discussion a little deeper so that uh, you can use that discussion to better understand the nano structures of carbon that uh, we will discuss uh, in the subsequent classes. Uh, so, that is why we would like to set that framework and uh, that is the reason why we will look at it. Uh, we will also uh, look at how we can distinguish between what is known as hard carbon and something else that is known as soft carbon. So, uh, again based on which book you read or which uh, uh, segment of the literature you read, uh, you will see some references to this. Uh, they are uh, actually uh, number of areas where uh, carbon shows up uh, in the literature. Uh, you will find it associated with uh, uh, say uh, energy related materials for uh, lithium ion batteries, for uh, fuel cells. Uh, so, many of those places you see carbon materials showing up in, dif in different forms including the traditional forms as well as the uh, nano structured forms. You will also see it associated with uh, creating composites for uh, structural applications. So, in all these cases you see this element showing up and uh, therefore, uh, some understanding of what is hard carbon, what is soft carbon uh, is uh, relevant to our discussion. We will close this class by uh, trying to describe the uh, general structure of uh, carbon nanotubes. So, uh, we will as we go further we will look at uh, in one of our subsequent classes we will look at much greater detail of uh, the carbon uh, nano structure or especially the carbon nano material uh, nano tube. Uh, but today we will certainly put uh, some basic idea of the carbon uh, nano tube. Uh, on the table so to speak, so that uh, you begin to understand uh, uh, how the connections come about. Okay? So, this is uh, what we will do in uh, today's class. Okay, so, uh, the traditional forms of carbon uh, are basically these two, you have uh, graphite and you have diamond. So, uh, for many, many, many years uh, this uh, was the form of, uh, I mean this was the knowledge of uh, uh, carbon that they existed in uh, that it existed in uh, these two forms primarily graphite and uh, diamond. Um, so, uh, incidentally uh, uh, the uh, thermodynamically graphite is considered uh, the most stable form. Uh, so, technically uh, if you take diamond and uh, you wait forever uh, you, you should end up uh, arriving at graphite under the right uh, circumstances. So, graphite is considered much more stable. So, you, you can see here that you know uh, in fact, we say diamonds are forever is the kind of you know general uh, public statement that is uh, uh, available that is because how uh, of how strong or how hard the diamond is, uh, but thermodynamically it is the face uh, graphite that is uh, more stable uh, so to speak. So, uh, incidentally, so why is it that you actually have it in different conditions? If, if I say that graphite is more stable, uh, why does diamond not abruptly change to graphite? Uh, why, why do you even have diamond? I mean, so, so that is something that we should always keep in mind. So, uh, that has got to do with the fact that uh, in general, 
any material that you take, uh, the faces that you see uh, are present uh, due to a competition between two aspects. The first is the thermodynamics. and the second is the kinetics. The thermodynamics tells us uh, what is the uh, stable phase. So, it tells us the uh, phase for which the free energy is the least and therefore, you know that that, uh, that is the phase uh, towards which uh, that element will tend towards. If you give it enough time, it will move towards that phase. But kinetically, uh, what happens is the kinetics is what tells us the rate at which that change happens. Okay, so, in, in all of chemistry you are essentially dealing with these two thermodynamics which tells us what will happen, kinetics which tells us at what rate that will happen. Uh, so, uh, many times you will see some phase that is stable at room temperature uh, that we see uh, and we use uh, industrially we use. So, uh, therefore, it is actually available to us uh, you know for extended periods of time in a very useful uh, manner uh, which is actually not thermodynamically the most stable phase uh, and, and the reason is that for it to become uh, to transform to the most stable phase, it will take thousands of years, uh, because it is at room temperature and, uh, and atmospheric pressure. If you put it under some other condition, let us say very high temperatures, very high pressures so or some, some, some other variation of those conditions, you may find that its transformation to the most stable uh, thermodynamic phase may occur very fast. Uh, but generally, uh, many times you have created it under some circumstances and uh, brought it uh, kind of uh, to room temperature and then atmospheric pressure and then it sort of stays uh, for our purposes it appears stable indefinitely. So, that is how you see the diamond uh, appears very stable uh, indefinitely uh, and uh, like with many things in uh, chemistry and metallurgy and chemical engineering uh, it has got to do with the competition between thermodynamics and uh, kinetics. Okay, so, now let us look at the structure, uh, structure of uh, these materials and uh, try to understand how they are relative to each other. Uh, what is uh, fascinating about one structure uh, relative to the other structure, what observations we can make in, in comparison. So, graphite as we know uh, is a structure which has a very layered kind of uh, you know uh, set of uh, uh, aspects to, with, to its structure. So, you have different uh, layers, each layer has uh, hexagonally bonded carbon atoms. So, you can see here, so these are all hexagonally bonded uh, carbon atoms that are sitting here. Uh, arranged in a hexagonal uh, uh, array uh, and then you have layers. So, this is one layer, this is a second layer and this is a third layer just for uh, uh, you know description sake we have put three layers together. Uh, they are sort of shifted with respect to each other you can sort of see that uh, uh, let us say this atom here uh, sort of lines up with the center here and it also lines up with the center there. So, uh, so you can see that that is what happens. So, it will so, sort of line up with this position. So, the central position there. So, the sheets are slightly shifted with, uh, with respect to each other in a, in a sort of a periodic arrangement, uh, but bet between them they are all uh, hexagonally bonded. Uh, so, everywhere you see these hexagons and these sheets uh, lined up on top of each other parallel to each other. So, now uh, if you see the uh, unit cell dimensions with respect to graphite. You see here I have written A is equal to B is equal to 2.46 angstroms. So, uh, now if you see the way the unit cell is uh, defined for uh, graphite, the carbon carbon bond length is not the uh, unit cell vector. So, when you see here ACC is 1.42 angstroms, this is the carbon carbon bond length. So, this number ACC equals 1.42 angstroms is the is the uh, is this distance that distance or if you take this distance here uh, any of those distances that you take between two adjacent uh, carbon atoms uh, in the uh, graphite structure uh, then you will see in the same plane uh, of the graphitic uh, structure then you will get 1.42 angstroms. So, uh, that is how we see the uh, ACC bond length. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the A equals B, which is the unit cell uh, vector so to speak, is actually the vector that you would draw let us say starting from this carbon atom, not to the adjacent carbon atom, but to the one after that. So, that you can call as uh, let us say if you call that A and then this would then be B. 
So, you can see that it is not from uh, uh, the uh, uh, carbon atom to its immediate neighbor which is the carbon carbon bond length, but then it is from uh, the carbon uh, one carbon atom to uh, the one that is uh, next to its nearest neighbor. So, it is not the nearest neighbor, so it is not this one, but it is this one starting from here. So, you start from there you do not take the next one, but you take the one after that. So, that is your uh, A equals uh, B kind of uh, dimension uh, and that is uh, 2.46 uh, angstroms. Uh, so, when you uh, look at uh, graphite, so this is the structure that we get and we also have one other dimension that we are uh, interested in when we look at uh, graphite, which is the uh, uh, C direction or called the, uh, so these are called 0, 0, 2 planes, the planes of uh, uh, carbon atoms that you see here, the 3 planes of carbon atoms uh, that you see here are called the 0, 0, 2 planes. And so, the distance between them is uh, referred to as D002, which is what I have got here, D002 and that is 3.35 angstroms. So, that distance is 3.35 angstroms, it is basically the distance between, uh, the vertical distance between uh, this plane of atoms and this plane of atoms. Okay, so, uh, that is the uh, uh, 3.35 angstrom. So, you have got A uh, dimension which is uh, 2.46, you have got B which is 2.46 and you have got C which is 3.35 angstroms. So, that is the uh, set of uh, uh, parameters that uh, help us define the uh, graphitic structure. Now, uh, you will see in the literature uh, or any uh, regular book that you read two uh, uh, I mean kind of uh, uh, terms that are used with respect to graphite. So, they will say highly ordered graphite and you also have disordered graphite. or description to this nature, you will find uh, uh, you know description that falls in this kind of category. So, what do they mean when they say highly ordered graphite or highly I mean or disordered graphite. So, uh, to understand the sense of order with respect to graphite, uh, we have to look at these uh, planes of carbon atoms. Now, each plane of carbon atoms is referred to as a graphene sheet. So, this is a graphene sheet. Okay, so, that is a graphene sheet. So, now actually, so when we look at research of uh, uh, in graphene that is uh, essentially what they are referring to a single plane of carbon atoms that are hexagonally bonded. Originally that was the definition for a graphene sheet. Today when we talk of graphene we have a little variation on this definition and there is a fair bit of discussion on exactly what should be called uh, graphene. Uh, but if you look at the original uh, definition I mean uh, every uh, single plane of carbon atoms uh, would be referred to as a uh, graphene sheet. Okay, so, when we discuss graphene we will look at this a little bit more uh, on how those definitions can be modified a bit, but for the moment our definition of graphene is a single sheet of uh, hexagonally bonded carbon atoms such as the one that you such as the 3 layers that you see here. So, now uh, what we refer to as uh, highly ordered graphite is a graphitic sample where these uh, graphene sheets are very large in extent. Okay, so, very large uh, area sheet is there. And then there are several such sheets stacked in the C direction. So, if you have thousands of such sheets stacked in the C direction and each sheet is very large, I mean uh, uh, several microns large, maybe more, maybe uh, centimeters large, whatever it is, some pretty large dimension relatively speaking uh, and those sheets are stacked uh, uh, on top of each other, uh, then that is considered uh, highly ordered graphite. Uh, there is one more uh, uh, element of description here which we have to be careful about and that is in addition to these sheets being stacked on top of each other, uh, they have to also be oriented correctly with respect to each other. So, you can have uh, graphene sheets that are oriented exactly like this, you can also have graphene sheets that are twisted. So, you can have them twisted this way or that way, in which case uh, the uh, basically the A direction. So, if, it, if I take the A direction of this sheet, the A direction of the next sheet and the A direction of the third sheet. So, I have just marked the 3 A directions, right. So, uh, we have the uh, A direction in 3 different uh, sheets that are uh, shown here. So, if the A direction of sheet 1, sheet 2, so let us just call this 1, 2 and 3. If the A direction of the 3 sheets uh, lines up exactly with respect to each other, 
so they are all oriented in the exact same direction uh, then uh, they are oriented the sheets are oriented with respect to each other but if the a direction of one sheet is pointed this way the a direction of the other sheet is pointed the other way then the sheets are sort of uh, uh, twisted or rotated with respect to each other so this kind of uh, uh, existence of graph uh, graphene sheets is possible inside some graph uh, graphitic samples so you can get get graphit uh, uh, graphitic samples where the sheets uh, inside the sample are not oriented in the same direction same with respect to a direction uh, inside the sample and some others where they are oriented in the same a direction with uh, respect to each other so if they are not oriented in the same a direction this is called a form of uh, this is a form of disorder that is present in graphite it is called turbostratic disorder so that form of disorder is called turbostratic disorder so uh, in a graphite uh, graphite example uh, if you want to say that it is uh, uh, you know highly graphitic we want the graphene sheets to be large we want several of those graphitic sheets to be uh, stacked on top of each other and we do not want turbostatic disorder we want them all aligned in the same a direction ok so the a directions of all of them should line up exactly on top of each other if that happens it is called a highly ordered graphitic sample and if it is a highly ordered graphitic sample then uh, the d002 comes to this value 3.35 angstroms so the d002 value comes to 3.35 angstroms now when you have disordered graphite exactly the same three things that I just mentioned will not be present to the degree to the same amount of uh, uh, value. So for, uh, so, for example, the uh, graphene sheets will be smaller, there will be less of them stacked on top of each other and then many of them will be twisted with respect to each other. So, you will have smaller sheets, lesser number of stacking and turbostatic disorder. So, if you have a combination of that, then we call that disordered carbon, disordered graphite. Usually for disordered graphite what you will find is that if you did the uh, x-ray diffraction of that sample uh, or any other characterization like electron microscopy and you find it is D002 value you will find that it is D002 value is actually higher than 3.35 angstroms. Uh, so, for disordered graphite D002 greater than 3.35 angstroms. So, here D002 is equal to 3.35 ok. So, so that is how you see uh, graphite you, uh, so the, the general structure is there a layered structure stacked on top of each other you can have it in ordered form which means you have large sheets uh, many of them stacked on top of each other a uh, direction lined up correctly you can have disordered version which is lesser number of sheets not stacked uh, not many of them uh, uh, smaller size sheets not many of them stacked on top of each other and with turbostatic disorder. So, this is ordered and disordered graphite. Please keep in mind this value of uh, the carbon carbon bond length of 1.42 angstroms we will get back to it in, uh, in just a moment after we discuss the other traditionally known form of uh, carbon which is diamond. So, to look at the diamond structure uh, it is easy to visualize it by first looking at the face centered cubic structure which is basically a cube which is what you see here and then uh, so these are the corners of the cube this is the cube corner. So, 8 atoms at the cube corners uh, and then you have a bunch of uh, face centered atoms. So, this one, this one also this is also a corner atom. So, this is a face centered atom, face centered atom uh, that is a face centered atom and this is a face centered atom. So, you will uh, 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 see here uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 face centered uh, atoms present. Uh, so, that is uh, whatever 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, 6 face centered atoms and the rest of them are corner atoms. So, if you now take one more face centered uh, array of uh, lattice points ok and you merge the two such that the second uh, uh, cell that you are putting uh, enters the first cell, but is uh, removed from this this point from this this location with, with from this location rather from this location we shift it diagonally through the body diagonal. So, what is the body diagonal? The body diagonal is this uh, line here which goes there. So, we shift it along the body diagonal by 1 fourth, 1 fourth, 1 fourth. So, if you shift 
quarter 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 into that uh, body diagonal and then place the first atom of the next uh, uh, face centered lattice somewhere here and then build the face centered lattice around it then what you will get is something like this. So, I have now got two face centered uh, structures which are uh, which have sort of interpenetrated each other. So, they have penetrated each other and then they are shifted with respect to each other by quarter 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 of this distance when I say quarter it is one fourth of this distance one fourth of the uh, lattice uh, length uh, along the body diagonal. So, one fourth of the uh, lattice length along the body diagonal. So, that is this distance ok. So, if you do that then you will get the uh, uh, this com combination structure is called the diamond structure ok. So, the diamond structure uh, comes like this and uh, it has uh, its own uh, uh, characteristics. So, so for example, the central atom here uh, is now bonded to uh, four uh, different atoms here. So, this is 1, this is 2, this is 3 and 4. So, the central atom is now bonded to uh, one corner atom uh, which is which I have marked as 1 and then three face centered atoms 2, 3 and 4 of the uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, face centered lattices. So, uh, what it actually means is that the central atom here is tetrahedrally uh, bonded to these four uh, atoms and so the uh, bond angle here is some 109.5 degrees. So, that is the bond angle and uh, that is how the uh, diamond uh, structure comes about. Uh, and the carbon carbon bond length here uh, is 1.5445 uh, angstroms. Uh, the diamond structure is very hard uh, because of this three dimensional uh, uh, network of uh, bonding that exists within uh, diamond and therefore, when you try to distort it in any manner these bonds which are all covalent bonds are very strong bonds they try to hold the structure uh, rigidly in some position and that is why uh, diamond is such a hard material. So, this is the structure of uh, diamond. So, if you uh, look at the comparison uh, what you see is in graphite the uh, uh, carbon atoms are sp2 hybridized uh, which uh, makes them distribute themselves in a planar structure and they are trigonal planar. So, that is why each carbon atom is now bonded to three other carbon atoms uh, three other adjacent carbon atoms which is what you will see if you uh, look at this structure here. So, you can see every carbon atom here. So, for example, if I take that carbon atom here it is bonded to 1, 2 and 3. So, 3 uh, carbon atoms it is uh, bonded to and so that is trigonal uh, planar uh, that is what you see here and uh, the there is there are pi bonds uh, which are above and below that uh, uh, the graphene sheet where the electrons can relatively more uh, easily move. And, uh, th and that is what gives the graphite its black color. Diamond on the other hand uh, un unlike this uh, sp2 hybridization actually has sp3 hybridization. The uh, geometry uh, of the layout of those atoms is tetrahedral uh, which is what we, uh, we saw in our uh, previous uh, slide. The bond angle is 109.5 degrees uh, again I marked that on the previous slide and there is there are no pi uh, pi bonds. Uh, so, there is uh, so the uh, all the uh, I mean all the bonds are covalent uh, and uh, there is there are no pi bonds uh, and so you, uh, in terms of band structure it ends up uh, being such that there is uh, I mean a significant uh, band gap and it basically results in diamond being transparent ok uh, whereas graphite is black uh, diamond is transparent. So, now uh, th this is the summary of graphite versus diamond, but if you actually just go back a little bit there is one interesting point we need to note which is this ACC bond length. So, for diamond it is 1.5445 angstroms and if you go back a little bit we note, uh, noted it down for uh, graphite it is 1.42 angstroms ok. So, we have 1.42 for graphite and we have 1.54 for uh, diamond. So, we will just put that here 1.42 angstroms and this is 1.54 angstroms. So, cc bond length right. So, this is what uh, we have here. So, that is uh, uh, what we have. So, now what does a bond length signify to us? A bond length basically uh, indicates to us how strong the bonding is the stronger the bond is the closer those atoms are going to be pulled together. So, that is an implication of uh, so it indirectly conveys to us 
which is the uh, which is the uh, material where the bonding is stronger. So, if you actually see what you see is that the carbon carbon bond length is actually lower in the case of graphite than it is in the case of diamond right. So, this basically means that bonding within graphite uh, within the graphitic plane is actually stronger than that in diamond. Okay, so, that is a very uh, non intuitive result because we always think of uh, graphite as a soft material that it can uh, uh, you know slide very easily many things can happen with uh, respect to graphite. So, we always think of graphite as a soft material we think of uh, diamond as a very hard material. In fact, that is one of the things that fascinates people about carbon and which is why so many books are written about carbon you can get it as one of the softest faces uh, uh, present uh, you can also get it as one of the hardest faces uh, present within the scope of. Uh, materials that are available to us. So, uh, therefore, uh, uh, in, in diamond uh, this is uh, uh, you know we find that actually if you look at the bonding, the bonding in graphite is actually stronger than that in diamond. Uh, so, that is a very interesting result to keep in mind and that tells us why there is so much interest in uh, graphene sheets, there is so much interest in carbon nanotubes and so on. Uh, you might think you know why not make everything out of diamond if you can theoretically make diamond uh, in some form. But you, you see here that actually the graph, uh, graphitic material is actually stronger than the diamond material which is not very uh, uh, intuitive. Uh, and the reason diamond comes across as a strong material is because it has the three dimensional network of bonding and that makes the whole structure rigid. Whereas, graphite has this layered structure where the layers can slide with respect to each other and that is why it comes across as a, a relatively weaker material. So, if you can uh, utilize the strength uh, the uh, in, uh, within planar uh, uh, intra planar strength of uh, graphite in some form uh, without having to worry about the sliding then you have really captured uh, or taken advantage of the extremely strong bonding that exists within each graphitic sheet. And that is uh, the uh, basic idea with which a lot of people look at nanomaterials based on uh, graphite uh, or, or some variations of graphite. So, this is the uh, uh, you know basic uh, idea with respect to the structures of the common uh, materials uh, graphite and diamond. Now, uh, amongst the disordered carbons as I said disordered carbon means the uh, uh, graphene sheets are small. and uh, less number of sheets stacked and turbostatic disorder. So, if you have that then you have a disordered carbon. Amongst the family of disordered carbons you can have something called hard carbon and something else called soft carbon. So, what is the difference? The difference is simply this uh, if you take disordered carbon and let us say you take it put it in a furnace uh, and you flow some inert gas you flow nitrogen or argon or something like that and you heat the sample. So, some powder powder of uh, this material you take you heat the sample to say 800 degrees C 600, 700, 800 degrees C uh, you keep it in the absence of air with some inert gas flowing you wait for a few hours you take it out and then you reanalyze the sample uh, for its structural uh, ca uh, characteristics. You will find that uh, some number of carbon samples are such that if you do this process of heat treatment in the absence of air for some few hours and then you cool it down and you look at the sample you will find that what was disordered has become more ordered. And if you do this heat treatment for a fairly long period of time it will become highly ordered. Okay, so, it will start as a disordered carbon if you keep doing this heat treatment it will become more and more and more ordered eventually you will have highly ordered graphite. In fact, there is one version of it called highly oriented pyrolytic graphite which is used as the standard for you know graphitic samples, but in general you can move in that direction. So, uh, graphitic samples which uh, disordered graphitic samples uh, or disordered carbon samples which can be heat treated and converted to highly oriented carbon samples are referred to as soft carbon materials. So, if you can heat treat it wait for enough time and it becomes a uh, oriented sample that is called a soft carbon. On the other hand there are other forms of disordered carbon samples where you can do exactly the same procedure take it to a uh, you know 700 800 degree C flow nitrogen or argon or some inert gas and you can wait indefinitely nothing will happen it will remain disordered 
you will take it out, you will do the analysis, it will continue to remain disordered, you can put it back in the furnace, wait for uh, several hours, take it out, again analyze it, it remains disordered. So, you will see that there is no improvement in order. That form of uh, carbon which does not improve its order when you do heat treatment is referred to as a hard carbon. Okay? So, that is the basic difference. So, when you see soft carbon, you know what it means. When you see hard carbon in, in some uh, book uh, or some discussion, you now know what it means. But the more fundamental question is, why is hard carbon the way it is and why is soft carbon the way it is? So, the uh, difference comes simply due to the source of carbon. So, for example, you can take uh, many polymeric materials. So, for example, natural polymer says let us say sugar. Okay? So, you can take sugar and uh, you can uh, put it through a thermal treatment. Uh, let us say basically in the absence of air, you can heat it uh, in, in, in uh, do some thermal treatment. Uh, you will find that the sugar will basically disintegrate and you will end up with a carbon uh, sample. Okay? All the carbon in that sugar will remain, other uh, you know constituents would leave and you will have uh, carbon available with you, a black carbon mass will be formed if you if you heat it under the right kind of conditions. So, that is how you can get one form of carbon. So, what is the speciality of it? The point is in, in a polymeric structure you have lot of cross linking. Okay? So, you have lot of cross linking. So, the carbons uh, uh, are arranged in some uh, three dimensional form with a lot of cross linking that is present. So, you can think of it as, so when, when it becomes a carbon structure, when you have removed all the other constituents and you have a remaining carbon structure what it effectively uh, uh, comes across as is basically a graphitic structure, a graphite sheet which is no longer a flat graphitic uh, sheet, but it is twisted in different ways and then you know bonded in all different directions. So, in, in, in this kind of a uh, hard carbon, uh, in soft carbon basically you are having sheets like this, except that they are smaller number uh, and they are turbostatically disordered. So, they, they tend to grow, they tend to grow in this, this direction and they start lining up and then and you get more of them lining up and that is how the soft carbon uh, starts off disordered and slowly becomes more and more ordered. Here on the other hand you do not have these flat sheets, you have something like that, another sheet which runs like that and third sheet that runs like that and so on. So, these already have uh, bonding in all uh, directions that are you know uh, not the planar direction. So, you may have some bonding between uh, the, sh the sheet that comes here and the sheet that comes here. So, here you may have a bond here you may have a bond, some other bond that is uh, here so on. So, many of these junct uh, junctions you will have bonds uh, and those are not going to break down uh, easily, they are as strong as the basic carbon carbon bond. So, unless you you know completely disintegrate this material to individual carbon atoms which will require a very high amount of energy, uh, unless you completely disintegrate this to, uh, into individual carbon atoms and then reassemble it from there, you are not going to start with this material and end up with uh, a graphitic structure. Right. So, this also has graphene sheets, the uh, disordered carbon also has, uh, the hard carbon also has uh, graphitic sheets except that they are not planar, they are not flat, they are uh, coiled. So, basically you take, a, you take a flat sheet, you coil it, you twist it, you make it come and form a bond somewhere else uh, and then in this complicated uh, uh, you know uh, alignment it is present. And so, for you will never be able to uncoil it, it is basically you have made knots, you have made knots of all sorts and you are, you are not going to remove those knots, it is just completely coiled up and therefore, it does not respond to heat treatment. So, this is the hard carbon, both of them have uses, uh, so hard carbon does get used in many electrochemical applications, it gets used in uh, you know people try to, people are in investigating its use uh, even in uh, you know battery applications and so on, same is true with soft carbon. So, it is not that any of these are useless, they have their applications and there is a lot of research that goes on in them. Okay. So, then now we come to the carbon nanotube, we have seen the traditional structures of uh, graphite and diamond, we now come to a carbon nanotube. So, what does a carbon nanotube look like? It is basically a tube, as the name describes it is a tube. So, let me remove this, So, it is it is a tube capped on uh, both sides uh, with hemispherical caps and inside this you have all the hexagonally bonded carbon atoms. Uh, I 
and then of course, uh, it starts getting like that and then uh, it continues that side. So, you have uh, you know you, so basically you have uh, uh, you can think of it as a graphene sheet that was a flat sheet flat graphite uh, graphene sheet that you took and then you made a roll you made a roll out of it. So, now you have a tube. So, instead of a flat sheet you now have a tube. So, that is how you arrive at uh, the the uh, uh, graphene uh, sorry the uh, carbon nanotube structure. So, the one of the questions is to uh, for you for us to understand uh, what is the strength of this sheet uh, it is always nice to understand what is the hybridization in this sheet. Uh, and to understand that you have to see what is the structure of the sheet. So, when it was completely fl uh, flat it was sp 2 hybridization as you saw uh, out here and then when it was uh, in the in the 109.5 degrees uh, orientation uh, and uh, tetrahedrally aligned it was sp 3 hybridization. So, uh, on the other hand so we have sp 2 and sp 3. So, uh, uh, what you see in a nanotube is uh, some uh, is a structure that is neither flat nor it is uh, completely at this 109.5 degrees uh, uh, angle that is there. So, in fact, what we have is mixed hybridization it is called mixed hybridization and so it is uh, it is got a hybridization which is partly which shows partly sp 2 character and partly sp 3 character. Uh, and uh, and that is how it relates to the two structures traditional structures of uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, graphite and uh, diamond. So, we will keep that thought in mind and uh, as uh, necessary we may uh, need to revisit it. So, this is the way this uh, structure is set up uh, at the two ends you have hemispherical uh, caps and this this consists of uh, pentagons and hexagons. So, here you have only hexagons. So, hexagonally bonded carbon atoms here you have pentagons as well as hexagons. Here also you can have disorder you can have disorder on the tube which we will talk about later, but uh, it is possible the description I am giving you now is for a well formed tube. So, the body of the tube only has hexagons and the end caps have an array of hexagons and pentagons which help you create those two end caps. So, that is the structure that we have. So, those two end caps come here and here. So, that is how those end caps come. So, if you look at uh, the discovery of uh, uh, carbon nanotubes uh, and the first reports of carbon nanotubes it is interesting to know the history of it uh, uh, because uh, that gives you some sense of perspective. Uh, so, uh, the uh, credit for uh, discovering uh, uh, single wall carbon nanotubes uh, for example, uh, is uh, given to Ijima. Uh, and uh, so, if you see any paper associated with uh, carbon nano material uh, nanotube uh, work uh, invariably there will be a reference right at the beginning which says that uh, uh, the group of uh, Ijima and co workers uh, discovered carbon uh, nanotubes uh, and that is uh, it is published in a uh, you know in nature 1993. There is another group also which is published in the same uh, uh, journal. Uh, and that is also listed there 1993, but the I guess the subsequent pages this is 603 to 5 and this is 605 to 7. So, the general credit is given to this group here and uh, that is considered by many to be a fair uh, fair way of ascribing credit for the work that has been done. Uh, and But the point you must remember here is some we are going to specify that as a single walled carbon nanotube. Uh, we will talk about that uh, exactly what it means a little later. Uh, but basically it means you just have one cylinder you can also have concentric cylinders uh, uh, one on top of the other and that would be called a multi walled carbon nanotube. So, for a long time uh, actually the multi walled carbon nanotube discovery was also attributed to uh, Ijima uh, to a paper 2 years earlier than the single walled carbon nanotube paper that I previously showed you. So, that is shown in a nature publication in 1991. Um, so, uh, but with a lot of people working beginning to work in this area. Uh, they looked at older literature and uh, they found that much uh, earlier. Uh, so, for example, in 1952 the earliest that they could find in 1952 they actually saw uh, publications where uh, um, there were uh, electron micrographs 
which showed uh, structures which were essentially carbon uh, nanotubes. It is just that uh, at that time they did not name it as a carbon nanotube. So, they just showed that carbon had that structure then they had that tubular structure and, uh, and so for example, the diameters that they showed were in the range of uh, 50 nanometers which is uh, sort of uh, expected and this is in this 1952 paper. Uh, and so, uh, today the, uh, uh, the way the credit is attributed is that the single wall carbon nanotube work is indeed attributed to Ijima, but the general uh, multi wall carbon nanotube work uh, is now uh, open for debate on to whom you should ascribe it to and one place where it seems like it is a more uh, reasonable way to ascribe it to is a much earlier uh, uh, reference so to speak. And you will see in, in all these cases the, uh, um, the uh, uh, discovery of uh, carbon nanotubes and the uh, you know reports of carbon nanotubes have been limited by the resolution of electron microscopes. So, actually this is true for all nanomaterial work. Uh, the resolution of the uh, electron microscope is uh, what has uh, uh, made a significant contribution. Improvements in the resolution have made significant contribution uh, in the field of uh, carbon nanomaterial study and in the field of nanomaterials in general. Uh, commercial models have been available since uh, 1939 in uh, to varying uh, degrees. Uh, so, the electron microscope itself has been around now for nearly 100 years uh, and the commercial models have been around uh, for about you know uh, 80 years uh, so to speak um, and continuously the uh, resolution has been uh, uh, improving. Uh, and also we must understand from a general perspective that uh, normally when somebody says microscope we think of magnification. So, we say higher the magnification you will get better uh, images you can see smaller and smaller uh, uh, detail right. So, that is the uh, general impression this is not really correct uh, more important uh, parameter is resolution this is very important to understand that magnification and resolution are very different. So, for example, even in an optical microscope you can put enough lenses and claim that you are having extremely high magnification, but you will not see anything you will see only a blurred image that is because the resolution is not high. And a good way of uh, understanding that is to see an image which shows you the difference between magnification and resolution. And for that uh, I just have taken this famous pillar which is there in Delhi, the Delhi ion pillar. This is not an electron micrograph, this is just a regular photograph, but it conveys this idea uh, uh, quite clearly to you. Uh, so, you can see the size of this image here and the size of this image are roughly the same which means the magnification. What is magnification? It is simply the actual object size uh, and how it relates to the uh, image size. So, image size divided by object size. So, if the object is 1 millimeter long and you have actually uh, magnified it to 10 millimeter size, you have done a magnification of 10 x. So, 10 times that size you are showing, showing the uh, object. So, whatever is the actual object. So, this Delhi ion pillar, this rust free pillar has some size. These two images are roughly the same size. So, both of them if you take the image size by the actual object size the uh, magnification is the same. But you can see that in this image the uh, details are very poor, it is very blurred, blurred image you cannot really make out the details. On the other hand on this image you can make out lot of designs here right. So, the uh, uh, so in, in normal description we say clarity of this image is better ok. So, detail in this second image, so the second image here this is the first image we will say clarity is better or we will say Okay, so, clarity is better, details are better visible right. So, this concept is what we refer to as resolution. So, only if you have resolution you can see the detail in that object that uh, whatever it is that you have magnified right. If you just see a blurred object you cannot make out anything in this object I cannot say anything about what is the uh, kind of pattern that is present in that region what is the design that has been put in that region right. So, if I were describing this in some paper I cannot say anything I can simply say it is some cylindrical kind of structure where towards the end of it there seems to be some additional work. Here I can say much more much more in uh, figure 2 I can say a lot more I can say exactly what kind of designs I see on top uh, in this region and how, how that differs from the rest of the pillar that is present right. So, similarly for carbon nanomaterials or any other nanomaterials for you to start saying something about the structure of that material it is not sufficient to have a highly magnified image of that nanomaterial. You need a highly magnified image of that nanomaterial which also shows sufficient detail and that idea of showing you sufficient detail is resolution. It is basically the ability to show two adjacent points
as two separate points. So, supposing I have a, a, a spot in the image which is black in color, another spot in the image which is uh, uh, gray in color. So, uh, light gray in color. So, now if, if the microscope helps me see this black spot separately and this gray spot separately, uh, I am able to say that uh, I can see two spots, right. On the other hand, if it is uh, creating an average, uh, you know, dull gray spot across the entire region, I can only see one dull gray spot. I cannot see that, I cannot say that there are two details uh, available there, right. So, that is the idea of saying that two adjacent points, the dark spot and the light spot, are seen as two separate points, the dark spot and the light spot, as opposed to one averaged point. So, the lower resolution ones will take multiple points in the object and then bunch them together and give you an, uh, you know, averaged uh, detail which from which you cannot make out much about the object. Higher resolution ones will take the same object and give you much finer detail. So, it is the same as what happens in your camera when they say so many megapixel camera and then you find one another camera which is even higher megapixels and so on. The higher megapixels is adding more points to the same image. So, therefore, increasing the detail. So, human eye for example, can uh, resolve roughly 0.1 millimeter in a typical reading distance which is about 18 inches. So, you keep a book 18 inches from you and there are some, some drawing is there. If that in that drawing you have details which are 0.1 millimeter apart, you can still make them out. You can figure out that there is a white spot and there is a dark spot and so on. If it gets smaller than this, you will only start saying gray spot. Your uh, eye will not be able to separate that as a dark spot and a light spot. So, this is resolution very important for electron microscopy and very important for the field of nanomaterials and it has made a difference in many of the discoveries of uh, uh, nanomaterials. So, with respect to carbon nanotubes, uh, 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 what we find is single wall carbon nanotubes uh, is uh, they have uh, dimensions or radii or diameters of this range 0.4 nanometers. So, that is 4 angstroms to 25 angstroms. And uh, the reason why there is a limit is that if you make it smaller than 0.4 angstrom's diameter, then you have to curve the, the curvature in the tube is too high. It causes a lot of, uh, you know, the curvature in the tube is too high. Uh, it causes a lot of uh, uh, forces uh, and strains in the structure. It is not able to sustain. So, it breaks up. So, it stays up. So, only up to some point you can curve the tube, okay. So, that is why you get 0.4 nanometer. If you make it very large, which is like this 25 angstrom. So, you have a diameter this large tube, you can actually make larger tubes, but then it is unable to keep a circular cross section, it collapses and forms like a ribbon, it forms this kind of a structure. So, you take a large paper and you make a cylinder, it will collapse down on itself. So, that is the point. In multi wall carbon nanotubes, you have uh, multiple tubes. So, so, you have a tube and then around it you have the next tube, then you have the next tube and so on that this is a multi walled carbon nanotube and the uh, intertube uh, distance here uh, is the uh, 3.34 angstroms, I mean sorry 3.4 angstroms which is slightly higher than the 3.35 that we indicated for highly graphitic sample, okay. So, which is greater than 3.35 angstroms for highly graphitic sample because this is not highly graphitic because you, it has got curvature in it and so on. So, that is what we see. And length wise people talk of very long lengths and so on uh, which are rep reported in uh, literature uh, several centimeters even larger lengths have been reported uh, and so on. So, you can make uh, tubes of this uh, nature. Uh, we will look at it in greater detail in our subsequent classes uh, uh, even at this uh, description of the carbon nanomaterial. Uh, but basically uh, you can uh, see here uh, a, a magnified view of the uh, nanotube, you can see here vari uh, various layers here layer, layer, layer structure, layer, layer, layer structure. So, these are concentric tubes uh, that are uh, uh, around uh, each other and that is how the tube is built and you get the overall tube. Uh, you can see this, uh, I mean we are having a 5 nanometer. Uh, so, this distance here is about 5 nanometers and that is uh, basically uh, what uh, you see on the uh, uh, image. So, uh, that is our uh, uh, sort of discussion on uh, uh, carbon uh, nanomaterials. Uh, I mean uh, to carbon at, at, uh, at its uh, you know initial description and how it uh, relates to nan nanomaterials associated with the carbon. So, in our conclusions or summary of what we discussed today, we find that diamond and graphite are uh, traditionally known carbon structures. Uh, we discussed how they relate to each other and how they are different from each other uh, and uh, which is more stable etcetera. Uh, we found that interestingly the carbon carbon bonding. Uh, uh, in within each sheet of uh, graphite is actually stronger than that in diamond. 
So, uh, within each sheet of uh, graphite is actually stronger than that in diamond, but it is a three dimensional structure of diamond that uh, gives us the appearance that diamond is stronger than graphite. Uh, the, and carbon nanotubes can be thought of as graphene sheets uh, which have been rolled to form a tubular structure. Uh, that is not actually how they are formed, but that you can think of it that way. And uh, we also saw that the discovery of carbon nanomaterials uh, has been limited by the resolution of uh, electron microscopes which have uh, you know evolved over the years. So, these are our major conclusions uh, in our uh, discussion uh, our initial discussion of uh, carbon. We will look a lot more uh, at the carbon nanotube in our subsequent classes. We will re revisit some of the carbon nanotube structure and uh, build on it and uh, we will also see a uh, lot of uh, aspects of other can carbon nanomaterials uh, uh, which can also be thought of which have also been made and have been investigated. Thank you.